Hello, Obophiles. I'm Danny Cruz, and today we have a very exciting interview with Martin Schuring, who is the professor of oboe at Arizona State University and also plays principal oboe with the Phoenix Symphony and with the Grand Tetons Festival Orchestra in Wyoming. He's also had a ton of other cool career opportunities, like playing in Hong Kong, the Florida Orchestra. He's a famous recording artist, and he's also the author of the book, Oboe, Art, and Method. Now, I have to give you a little bit of explanation before we start the interview because I didn't plan on doing the interview. I kind of stumbled into it a little bit. I was on tour with the LSU Wind Ensemble for the CBDNA conference in Tempe, Arizona. That's a conference for band directors. I think it's College Band Directors, uh, CBD, National Association, or something like that. And they invited a bunch of wind ensembles to come and play for a bunch of college band directors. It's kind of a world apart. So we're, we're on tour on this bus, and the thing is nobody knows how to party like they do it in Baton Rouge. <laughs> and so I was so exhausted, so kind of not well organized for the interview, and I wasn't able to pace it very well like I would have hoped. But we still got the interview with Martin Schering, which I think is going to be really valuable for the oboe world, so I wanted to share it with you anyway. The first question that I asked, was how did Martin Schering get into the oboe? In other words, how did he begin playing? Almost by accident, because I, I took as a, I have a German background, so oh, the, okay. the standard German schoolboy instrument of choice was the recorder. Okay, yeah. So I participated in a recorder class where we sat around and played every week, and I took piano lessons, and I started wondering if there was some way I could maybe play in a band or an orchestra or something that was you know, not a recorder oh. choir yeah. or a solo piano. Um, so I asked my recorder teacher, I said, I want to play in a band or an orchestra, and uh, what do you think I should explore? She said, oh, your face and your jaw and everything, it's all perfect for the oboe. Okay, I mean, that, <laughs> I didn't know. That's interesting, yeah. <laughs> right? I didn't, I didn't even know what it was. So I went into the junior high band director's office, and I, I said, uh, I want to learn to play the oboe. And the guy damn near passed out, because in 30 years of teaching, nobody had ever said those words to him, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, he got me a plastic reed off the shelf and a fingering chart and an oboe that, where the, the body was actually made of metal. I didn't know that was wrong. Okay. Um, so I'm sure it sounded just awful at first. Um, but I enjoyed it. I Eventually I got lessons, and then I got lessons from a better teacher, and then I got really excited about it when I did a couple of summer things and and decided that of all the things that I was decently good at, this was the one that I had the most enjoyment from. Um, so I was going to follow it up seriously. Um, and it worked, eventually. So Professor Schering is a really intelligent guy, like super smart. He could have been successful doing anything. And I love that he chose his path based on something that he actually loved doing, something that he really enjoyed. And because of that, was able to put in the work and effort and focus to be really successful at it. Now, there is a lot to be said for being a self-driven and motivated learner by your own account, but Professor Schering reminds us that this is only half of the equation. So, learning and teaching are two different things. Yeah. Um, so... The learning part, you know, it takes a while to cook, right? And Mr. Delancey spoke very often just in concepts. He would let you kind of figure out how to build in the details. Um, so some of the things that he taught, I didn't understand until, you know, 10 years later, when all of a sudden I was for some reason able to do that thing. And then the light bulb would go off like, oh yeah, that's what he was talking about. Um, so the learning took a while, and then the teaching is something that I've always really liked to do. When we were kids, my sister always called me Martin the Explainer, <laughs> Okay. you know? Um, and so I've always enjoyed that. I've always enjoyed solving a problem, figuring out what the problem actually is at its basis, um, rather than trying to treat the symptoms, I'm trying to figure out what is the disease and how do we get rid of it. Um, 
so that's just always that's the way my mind works and I really am a big fan of common sense um, and logic and, and logic yeah and and those processes um, so I don't think that I actively set out to develop a philosophy of teaching mm -hmm. it's just that I was I've been trying all along to clarify things in my mind so that when I hear somebody do something on the, on, the, on the instrument that I can help them. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's what it's basically about. Yeah. So Martin Schering has famously helped a lot of his students become successful on the instrument. And he's also one of the pioneer content creators, is what we call him today, of written resources for people who may not have had access to a great teacher, but still were hungry for more information and wanted to get better at the instrument. So I asked him, how did he begin writing the resources that he put up online in, I think, the late 90s and later became his book? Well, I started probably, I started doing things in like the mid 90s mm -hmm. um, when I was new on the teaching scene yeah. and I just was trying to figure out ways to get noticed. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one way that seemed at the time, at least, to resonate with the age group I was going for. Um, and what I really need to, I mean, the information in there is is sort of not time sensitive, right? It can exist as it is forever. Um, but I think I need to update the thing. I think I need to just hire somebody and put up a website that looks like it was made in this century. <laughs> um, so. That's good. It's good that it exists, though. It's really yeah, funny. thanks. Yeah. But, I mean, people expect the web to be dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. You go to CNN and you go back 10 minutes later and it looks different. Yeah. Um, I don't have their budget, obviously. Right. Um, okay. But I ought to do something a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that has served to develop your... Well, I mean, serve your teaching career is maybe not the right way to put it. Um, no, I think it. the website is mm -hmm. just that... I don't have any evidence of how directly that has helped me, um, but some of the articles there developed into larger articles that were published in the Double Read, and after a, a series of four or five of those was published, um, people would come up to me at conferences and just jokingly say, hey, when's the book coming out? <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's not a bad idea. Um, so then I expanded some things, and for the longest time, the book uh, just sat on my computer as this big, untidy, 100-page pile of notes. Um, and then finally I put it together. So that, I think that was a, that was a, a cool project. I was really happy that that book worked out. And yeah. That it's still in print and people enjoy it. It's well received, yeah. Yeah. Of course, I was curious about other oboe literature and how he felt about it, if he had a favorite, so I asked him about oboe methods, and the answer surprised me. I don't really, I read everything. Yeah. I read everything, because, you know, there's, I mean, we have this alphabet, right? Mm -hmm. And there's only so many ways to structure the combinations of the various letters, right? That, it, so no, I don't think anyone's going to come up with like this radically creative, brilliant new solution to all of our musical problems. Um, but I read, I read everything just because I can always pick up an idea or two, or, or sometimes identify things that I think are inefficiencies, right? right? Where the writer is trying to enter through all the windows instead of just going through the front door. Yeah. Um, so I, I wouldn't say I have a favorite, but I would say that I read it all. Uh, I, think that, I think that's my favorite advice so far. And then he gave some golden advice about the learning process. Well, because, I mean, your learning process is formed in part by the teaching you receive. Mm -hmm. But I think in a larger sense, it is formed by the things that you consume. Mm -hmm. Whether it's reading or, or listening or going to master classes or just thinking about how to better structure something. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the whole learning process should be um, a process of addition and subtraction, where you hear something and you think, I really want to know more about this, I really want to be able to do that, and so that's a direction. 
or you hear something and you think, I'd really rather never sound like that. Mm. Um, so that's also valuable. Right, it, just, it helps you discriminate. Yeah. Sounds. Consuming performances is super important. And I asked him a little bit about where you gain your working and peripheral knowledge about music if you're going to pursue a career. When I went to, this is, it's different now, but when I went to Curtis, um, there, were, there were no music history classes. It just wasn't offered, it wasn't part of the curriculum. That's interesting. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? But it was expected mm, that you. you would study enough on your own right. to learn the historical surroundings of the pieces you were studying. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's how we all learn. There's not time in a four-year undergraduate curriculum to teach you all the things you need to know. Right. So all we can hope really is to give you some tools that help you to figure out where to go to look for the stuff you need to know. Uh, kind of, you have to be self-learning learner. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So Martin Chang plays in Wyoming over the summers, which is super high altitude compared to at sea level. So I asked him about reed making and how he prepares to travel with a difference in altitude that is that great. I'm going to ask you about reeds. Uh-oh. Oh. oh. <laughs> um, do you have any advice for changing climates as far as remaking and altitudes? Uh, how to kind of prepare? Yeah. Um, so I've never been good at anticipating. Right? So every summer I play at the Grand Teton Music Festival, elevation 6,300 feet. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I've been doing this for over 30 years. You'd think that I could just sit here and scrape up a bunch of reeds that I know are going to play there. But I can't do that. Okay. So what works for me, though, in any kind of travel situation, is to take along however many reeds you want that have reached the crowing stage. Okay. Right? It makes a nice rattle. It takes a little too much effort to get that rattle to happen. If you put it in the instrument, it would be quite impossibly noisy. Um, but it's vibrating. Mm -hmm. uh, then from that stage, it doesn't seem to matter where I go. I am able to fix it and react to the reed and adapt it to where I am. Many times there's not that much difference. So if I, you know, here it's normally very dry. Today is an exception. Mm -hmm. um, it's normally very dry. So if I go from here to say Houston, I'm gonna have a problem. Okay. Right, the reed's gonna swell up and not cool. be happy anymore. If I go to 6,000 feet altitude, the reed's going to shrivel and not be really very useful anymore. So, um, But otherwise, if I go to like somewhere in the Midwest, it's near the sea level, it's dry there too because the heater's on all day long, um, I don't really notice that much difference. And, and, you know, various people have different levels of sensitivity. Mm -hmm. You know, there are about a hundred miles south of here is a city called Tucson. Mm -hmm which is about a thousand feet higher in elevation than we are. And quite a few people report that their reeds are very different when they go there. Okay, because um, of elevation. Because of a thousand feet difference yeah. in elevation. Um, I haven't really noticed that. Do you think that's enough? Really? I mean, to where I need to get the knife out, I mm -hmm. can just make it work. It's like it works. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's because of the reconstruction or because of the uh, body of the player? I think it's the body of the player, right? Because different... And anything that your reed won't do, you have to do physically. Mm -hmm. And anything that you physically can't do, the reed has to do for you. Um, so I think everybody's sort of balance of skill sets in those areas is a little bit different. And some people can just physically tough through it, and other people need it to be just right or they're not comfortable. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was also curious about his own education. He went to Curtis, one of the most famous music schools in the country and perhaps the world, and he studied with John Delancey, who is a direct student of Tabato, one of his most famous students. So I was super curious about his own education and relationship with his teacher. So he was heavily focused on teaching us how music worked. Um, he used the word grammar a lot, that music also has <clears throat> punctuation and inflection and things just like speech. Um, so he was, tr that was his primary emphasis, was making sure that we really understood when looking at a piece of music how it would break into thoughts and how to combine those into larger ideas. Um, 
So I, of course, I talk about that a lot. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, other things that you learn, you learn, and then you gradually adapt along your own path. Um, so I don't know if I feel like I'm some kind of descendant of Philadelphia, um, <clears throat> but it was a huge influence in my life, and a lot of the things that he talked about in terms of um, just tone concept and, and efficiency in playing, those are still things that I think about every day, for sure. And then, of course, we had some fun questions. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of fun questions, just real short. Did you say fun? Yes. <laughs> I, okay, I, I'll, 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 I'll try. try. Is fun allowed in here? I hope it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so favorite um, read tool that you've gotten in the past, like, how many years? This ruler. Okay, can I close up on that? Sure. Good old ruler, and can you tell us a little okay. bit about it? So this is made by a company called Musecco. Musecco. The owner is the principal oboist of the San Francisco opera, Mingja Liu. Okay. He's a brilliant, brilliant musical artist and also a really creative um, des designer for products like this. Um, anyway, I like it because it's... You can, you can hit zero without anything. There's a little notch that shows you if you're tied past the end of the tune oh, or not. That's cool. Um, it works right-handed or left-handed. It has yeah. a separate cutout over here for English horn reeds. Awesome. Um, has these little diameter cutouts for cane tubes. And so, <laughs> I okay, think that's yeah. pretty nice. Cool, and you can buy those online. I'm sure. yeah. Okay. yeah, we'll put a link. Uh, not sponsored, hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool. Uh, what is your favorite uh, food right now? Oh. <laughs> um, I'm a, I'm kind of a meat eater. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'll eat almost anything and I will enjoy almost anything. But if you give me a preference of what would you like to eat tonight, I'll, I'll take a medium rare steak. But of course, I wanted to get a little bit more wisdom before I left. So I asked him about a book recommendation. There's a book by um, David McGill. A sound in Motion? Sound in Motion. Okay. Yeah. Sound in Motion. Yeah. That, okay. um, you know, all the, <laughs> all the things that Mr. Delancey tried to teach us about music and how it works, um, David was really paying attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and... I don't know if he took notes or what he did, but his recall of all of this information is just fantastic. Um, and he explains it in great detail and he explains the concepts very carefully. Um, so, if you know, it's based on something I really believe, which is that musicality is not a thing that you're born with, it's not an instinct. I mean, it can be, of course, some people are more musical in terms of reaction to music than others. Um, but more than that, David and I and Mr. Lancey all believe that music is a skill that you can learn how it is made, and by doing that you can be intelligent in, in cr creating your own music. Um, so I think that's extremely useful because you can't just wait to feel inspired in order to play nicely, right? You have to do it every day. Um, so I would highly, highly recommend that to any musician who wants to improve their... Their musicianship, yeah, and, and just their ability to sound like an intelligent musician when they play their instrument. I'm so glad that I asked, and I just ordered that book online. Now for one final question. The last thing is, what do you do for fun? Um... What do I do for fun? <laughs> I work a lot, which is not a complaint. I enjoy it. Um, so, for fun, we have this... This isn't going to sound like fun, but it's nice. <laughs> it's something that we enjoy. Okay. Uh, my wife and I, we have this sort of evening ritual where we, all, we both have our own things that we do in order to prepare the meal, and, and, and so... We work, on, we work together, we make a nice meal, we eat the nice meal, we just hang out for an hour or two um, and connect, reconnect, whatever, with each other.
each other that way. I think we both really enjoy that and we look forward to it. That sounds like fun. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for um, the education and letting us uh, peer a little bit into your thoughts on the outlaw. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. I hope you guys really enjoyed this interview with Martin Schering. If you have any questions or comments or things that you would like to additionally know, leave them in the comments below and uh, maybe he'll get back to you. He's pretty uh, tech savvy as we've seen. And as always, don't forget to subscribe and like the video below. It really helps out the channel. And also as always, when in doubt, play beautifully.